there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today I'm going to show you the progression of this mixed media painting. Sometimes a painting does not go in a start to finish process. Sometimes we add a little bit of this and a little bit of that until we're happy with the result. Kind of like making a pot of chili versus baking a cake. We aren't exactly sure how we want it to come out until we're done, so we constantly tweak the recipe of our creation until it looks just right. I cherish the time I get to create in such a free and intuitive manner. It's magical to get lost in your art, and one of my favorite things to do when I have the time to create like this is listen to an audiobook. I think it's because it exercises both parts of the brain. Listening engages a left brain associated with language, while painting engages the right side of the brain, and it's such an enjoyable experience. This video is brought to you by Audible, which, if you don't know, is an online audiobook company. One of my favorite audiobooks is The Fellowship of the Ring, the first of the Lord of the Rings series by J.R.R. Tolkien. I love the Lord of the Rings stories, but I'm a bit embarrassed to admit that I never could sit down and read them all the way through, but I can listen to Rob Inglis read for hours. He brings the story to life, and I've probably listened to the three books in that series as well as The Hobbit five times. That's a great thing about Audible. You get to keep the books you download, so you can listen over and over again if you want. Audible is offering a free 30-day trial to my viewers. You can download a book from their site for free, and it's yours to keep regardless if you want to keep subscribing after the 30-day trial period is over. After the 30 days, the Audible subscription is only $14.95 a month, and that gives you a free audiobook and a 30% discount on other audiobook purchases, which is an amazing value. To learn more, please visit audible.com slash frugalcrafter or click on the link in the video description. I've sped up the footage on this video so you can kind of see how the paint reacts and what happens when it dries. The background wash you saw me put in at the beginning of the video, um, I just sprinkled some, some salt in there. And as it dries, you're going to see the really cool cauliflower shapes and star snowflakey shapes that the salt makes. I think it's a really fun way to add texture in the background of a piece. I'm just working in an inexpensive watercolor sketchbook. This is an Aquafine sketchbook um, with 140 pound cold press cellulose watercolor paper. So nothing expensive here. I like to uh, put like an overall wash in a lighter color and I used a yellow and then I'm just dripping in shades of green and blue and letting it wick out. I'm putting the color closest to like the face and the arms. Um, that way it'll be a little more shadowed and darker in those areas and give you a little bit more depth. Now you can see where my brush touched uh, right next to the wet background. It let some of that background color wick into the wings. I think that looks kind of cool, but if you want to avoid any um, colors traveling from section to section in your painting, you can just leave a little sliver of unpainted paper and that will do that. Or you can let the background dry completely before proceeding on to the next step. Now I have this really fun product called Schminka Aqua Bronze and it almost looks like solder. It's so shiny. And I find that by adding that into some of my washes, it just gives it a really almost mirror like reflective image. It's kind of hard to see on camera, but it just really shines and has a really fun, um, fun look. Now this product here that I'm adding into the wet paint is called um, Liquid Metals and it's by Ken Oliver, the same company that makes all those color burst powders. And that's kind of also a fun way to add some iridescence. It behaves a little bit more like an ink than a watercolor, uh, but it mixes really well with all of these other water media products. I'm just playing and having fun and taking this opportunity to try some products that I haven't really used enough in my opinion, because they're taking up space. I might as well use them. So something I like to do sometimes if I have puddles of color like I do in the wings, I'll pull some of that color off, put it on my palette so I can use it again, or I'll pick it up and paint different areas of my painting with it like I did with the eyes. Now I dried my paper. You can kind of see the texture uh, that formed in the background with uh, with the salt. Uh, you can see the little bits of shimmer on the wings from the dried ink again. Um, and this is one of those things that shows up a lot more in person than it does on camera. And now what I'm doing is simply wetting some of the um, skin areas so I'll be able to put in some paint and kind of let it flow around so I won't have any hard edges. That's a thing you want to keep in mind when you're working with watercolor. If you wet your paper, you will have soft edges. If you work on dry paper, you'll have hard edges. So learning those um, kind of tricks of the trade is really helpful. Another thing to remember is that um, kind of like the law, it's not really the law of gravity, but it's kind of like the law of watercolor. Uh, your paint is going to flow uh, from greater wetness to least wetness. So if you have a really, really wet brush loaded with paint and um, 
pigment and you have damp paper, the water and the pigment is going to travel from the juicy wet brush and whoosh onto the damp paper because it wants to balance things out. So um, if you kind of keep that in mind, if you're thinking, why isn't my paint flowing? I've really wet this paper. Why won't it go anywhere? It's probably because your brush is not as wet as your paper. Your brush is probably drier than your paper. So remember that your paint travels from greater wetness to least wetness. So it's going to want to whoosh and flow and, and uh, balance out the wetness. And what I'm doing here is just filling in the rest of the skin tones. I'm not worried about it being patchy at this point because I'm going to add layers. I can add gouache and I can um, keep building up until I get just the look that I want. Tiny details matter. What I've done here is mixed up kind of like a light blue gray and added it to the whites of the eyes. And now I'm adding a little bit of pink right in the corner edges where the membranes are. I know this isn't like a super realistic portrait, but little touches like that really help bring the piece to life, I think. If any of your pencil lines are too dark, you can, you can also go in at this point where everything is dry and you can lighten them up with an eraser. I like to go through and start to get my values in at this point. So what I'm doing is um, painting details in the eyes, painting the lips red, um, getting some color on the cheeks. One way that I like to smooth color out is I'll start to go in with quite a bit of color on dry paper, and then I will rinse out and blot my brush and spread it around a little bit. So I find that technique really helpful for adding a little bit of uh, blush to the cheeks or um, a little bit of pink to the end of the nose or the chin. I also need to adjust my shadows, and the neck is always more dark, more shadow than the face because of the way the light would hit your face and then your head would cast a shadow on your neck. So I'm going ahead and putting that in right now. The paint I'm using is um, a combination of gouache, which is an opaque watercolor, and um, the uh, Prima marketing watercolors because they do tend to be a little bit more opaque, especially the Pastel Dream set. So I find that mixing that with gouache is an extremely effective way to do skin tones. I am again just kind of jumping around to different parts of my portrait, uh, adjusting the colors, adjusting the values. Value is simply how light or how dark something is and building up my skin tones until I'm happy with the result. If you need a little help with skin tones, you can always save photos from magazines or look up some reference photos online so you can just kind of see how the light hits your um, like your face, where the shadows are, what the skin colors are, that sort of thing could be very helpful. One thing that's usually true across the board is that your upper lip is darker than your bottom lip, so as you're painting, you can build up your layers of shadow on your upper lip to make it look a little more realistic. Um, I'm going ahead and putting in her dress at this point, and I'm starting with kind of like a goldish uh, base tone, and then I'm dripping in some reds. I kind of want it to um, have a nice contrast between the wings and the sky. So I'm also using some warm metallic inks, some coppery's, reds, and gold colors. And I'm just pretty much guiding it a little bit with the brush, but letting gravity take its course and just letting the paint and ink flow where it wants to flow. I realized as I'm watching myself create this piece in time lapse that I tend to approach everything the same way to get my like kind of base colors down. I like to wet an area, I like to drip in lots of juicy paint and ink, and then I uh, like to add details after it's dry. And that's what I'm doing with the hair as well. I um, wet the hair with water and then I'm just going in and adding the pigment. Um, this is a fairly small area, so you can just go in with the juicy pigment first and then spread it around like I am right here. Um, just make sure you let it dry before you put more details on top so that those up above lines will remain crisp. I like to have a good variety of brushes when I'm working on a portrait. Um, I tend not to use tiny brushes much in other types of painting, but for portraits I find them to be very useful. I've mixed up some dark brown using blue and brown, and I am doing the uh, upper lash line and some eyelashes. I can fuss around with this part of the portrait while I'm waiting for the hair to dry, which is really nice because then I don't have to stop and get out my dryer and spend a lot of time doing that. I also tend to paint the pupils of the eye in with that same dark brown that I use for the eyelashes rather than going in with black. If I decide I need a deeper pop of color later on down the road, I can always go over that with black watercolor or black ink, but I kind of like to um, reserve that to the end only if I need it because I often find using a straight black is just a little too much on a portrait. You may spend a lot of time working on your piece, so make sure that you are comfortable. Turn your paper around if you need to while you're working. Um, get up, move around a little bit if you have to. It can be really easy to lose track of time when you're creating in this manner, so you don't want to end up with a stiff neck or a cramp in your back because you sat in one spot too long. You always want to make sure that you're not holding your breath, that you're being comfortable, and you're really enjoying the process. So here I'm going in and I am adding more little bits of shadow on the chin. Um, 
um, adding the shadow under the cheekbones, just basically pulling in um, darks and lights where I think I need them. Now we're gonna start in with some opaque layers. Up until this point, everything I've been doing has been very watery and fairly transparent. So I've made a more of a body color and what this is, basically what body color means is I've added white. And um, I've got some white gouache that I've been mixing into the colors I've been using for skin tones. And what this does at this stage of the game is it gives you um, a much creamier complexion. Um, it just, kind of adjusts things. It's kind of like if you're gonna wear a foundation on your skin, it evens things out, it makes things look a little more flawless, and it helps, uh, I think, really bring the piece together, make the the um, the face look a little bit more rich and full. And um, it's really a great exercise to kind of learn how to mix your own skin colors from you know, your average watercolors. And then when you go ahead and you go in with the more opaque layer down the road, you're gonna notice how those foundational layers that you put down with the shadows and the colors really help support the highlights and the uh, body color that you're adding on top. If your paint is wet, you can almost just pick up the white on its own and go in and throw in some highlights. You can pick up those edges you may have lost like on the brow bone or the bridge of the nose or the ears and uh, really almost bathe your subject in light. And I think it's just such a nice effect. Now this doesn't happen in five minutes. Um, I have, I'm probably at about 45 minutes working on this portrait. So I just want you to know that if you're at home um, painting along that it takes some time and you're gonna go through portions of your painting where it is a hot mess and you think you've completely ruined it but keep going keep plugging along because it will get better you've got to hit that hot mess stage you have to just kind of lose yourself in the art and um, keep adding until you get it just the way you want it now here I'm using a product that is um, called mermaid markers they're made by Jane Davenport and they are basically like a liquid watercolor in a pen form and I really like them they're super transparent and rich in color and I can go over the uh, hair I already painted and and just give it those um, darker, brighter streaks of blue. And that's what I'm doing right here. And I thought, well, if she's got blue hair, she probably has blue eyebrows. So I'm going ahead and uh, putting that in too. Now my trick for keeping things symmetrical when I'm doing a portrait is painting upside down. So you can see I've flipped my painting around and uh, I find that if I'm working on eyes or eyebrows especially, painting them upside down is really helpful. Uh, sometimes I'll get one eyebrow in just the way I like it, then flip the thing upside down. And instead of telling myself oh, I'm painting an eyebrow, I just tell myself I need to mirror what I already have there. Um, I think if you're uh, right-handed, you probably paint the the um, right-hand sides of your subject easier. So when you flip it around, you get to paint the right side twice. Basically, I think it's just a little bit um, a little bit easier. There, you can see what I mean about the shadow on the upper lip. I've painted the upper lip a little bit darker, and it makes it look a little bit more realistic. Now, once that's dry, um, you can go in with other media. I did decide that that hair really should be going all the way down to the shoulder. So with those pens, since those are so uh, deep in color, I can go right in and add that hair there. But since I did that in one section, I felt like I needed to deepen it elsewhere so that it didn't look out of place. Um, that's just a little trick. If you do something to one part of your picture, do it somewhere else, and that will make your painting have this um, continuity and it will make it feel like you intended something not that you're just trying to fix a mistake after the fact so if you do it to one area do it again now I was thinking of though of the wings of this fairy being kind of like you know butterfly wings and it would need veins kind of to carry um, I guess blood to the wings or whatever but you know if you see a butterfly they have the veins in it that's what I was thinking here I didn't want it to be really um, uh, bold though so I thought well what if I do something with the the shimmery aqua bronze because if you hold it to the light you're gonna see the veins but then they'll just kind of fade away I find sometimes when you're putting in a lot of detail in a large area like that especially linear detail um, you end up getting uh, it, it just is too bold and it looks really out of place so by doing it with that gold I'm pretty much just gonna catch the light and that's what you're gonna see. And I'm doing the same thing in the hair, I'm doing the same thing throughout the painting just to create that continuity. And it does give you a just a beautiful shimmer. Now I'm using this bottle of ink to directly add some uh, blue highlights to the hair, this metallic blue. And again, it's one of those things, it's not gonna be very bold until the light hits it and then you're gonna see that beautiful shimmer. 
and I can guide those inks around with my watercolor brushes. The binder in those inks is uh, like a gum arabic. It's not going to hurt your watercolor brushes to use that. I just wanted to let you know with those particular Ken Oliver inks, um, they are a watercolor ink. You can use your watercolor brushes. And then I just wash them like I normally would. You actually just rinse them. Uh, they don't really take a lot of cleanup, which is something I really appreciate when I'm working. So if you were more of an acrylic painter and you um, you didn't have gouache, you didn't want to go out and buy gouache for this project, use your acrylics. I happen to prefer gouache because I'm a watercolorist and you know I don't have to have, get out different brushes to use them. I can use my watercolor brushes, uh, but you totally could use gua uh, acrylics, you could use oils, you could use casein, use what you have, use what you're comfortable with, use the medium that speaks to you. As we progress in the painting, we keep refining the objects we've already painted. So now I'm going ahead with the dress and I'm adding streaks of kind of a bronzy red color to uh, just give some form to the dress. I'm adding a little more color to the lips. I like that color. It's nice to take one color and add it somewhere else. And as I'm making these little changes, um, I wanna make sure I dry them between adding more on top. Uh, it's just a lot easier to correct an area that um, if you've dried what's underneath because you won't end up lifting what's underneath. Now for final touches, I like to use colored pencils. Um, I actually personally like Prismacolor color pencils and color soft color pencils because they have really opaque soft um, waxy leads. Uh, I do find that the Durant color softs don't break as much as Prismacolors, uh, but I still have tons of Prismacolors colors because that's what I had always used uh, in the past. So use whatever you have, but um, if you are on the lookout for an opaque pencil, getting a wax based pencil is going to be more opaque than a oil-based pencil but it's all it's completely up to you one isn't better one isn't worse it's just whatever you like to do I like using a cream color pencil for highlights and even white like after I've pretty much established all of my values I'll go in with that white pencil and just add the brightest of my highlights you don't want to overdo it with the white that's kind of like the cherry on top or the icing or the, the sprinkles on the cupcake rather because it does uh, pack quite a punch and if you overdo it then you lose the impact that it has Another thing I like about colored pencils is that you can add a lot of movement into your work. You can add a real linear quality because you're laying down fine lines. I can go with my, with my metallic pencils and add uh, highlights to eyelashes, eyebrows, and the hair. I can go in with indigo and I can add deep shadows in the hair. I can um, even go in with a black at the end if I feel like I want that little extra pop. But again, that is my reserve color that I wait to the way end um, in case I feel like I really need to pull that color out. But I love how I can put a soft highlight on the skin. I can put a soft highlight on the lips. I can um, add these finishing touches that really pull it together. I did decide I would use a little bit of black and that's what I'm doing right here. And you can see how just those sharp little um, bits of black make the eyes really pop, make the uh, depth um, of the hair kind of shine a little bit more and uh, make the pupils in the eye really, really kind of rich and dark. But I think it's because I had all those colors that I was layering. If I had just used black on its own, it'd be a very dead black. By layering all those colors, you really do get a, a much more realistic look. And again, I can't stress enough, flip that painting upside down and look at it from another angle that gives you a fresh perspective and fresh eyeballs on it. And then you'll be able to tell if one of your eyes is a little bit higher or a little less open. If you need to make adjustments, color pencils are great for those adjustments because they will stick on top of the gouache and on top of the watercolor. A tip for adding softer color with colored pencils is to hold the pencil at the end. That way you're not putting so much pressure down and you can get that soft blush like I did in the cheeks earlier. Um, it's just a great tip whenever you, you want to add some color but you don't want to go in too firmly. And of course, alternately, if I want to have more control and I want to have a crisper line, I can hold the pencil closer to the tip and uh, really guide and precisely control where that's going. So at this point, I'm pretty much putting in just my finishing touches. I'm using some soft brown shades to add shadow and just sharpening up any portions of the painting that I think need sharpening. I want to thank Audible for sponsoring today's video and invite you to try Audible free for 30 days by visiting audible.com slash frugalcrafter. You can download a book for free and it's yours to keep regardless if you choose to continue your subscription after the 30 day trial or not. I like to listen when I'm cooking, cleaning, painting, driving, and exercising. It's probably my favorite way to read. Click the link in the video description to start your free trial today. Thanks for stopping by and until next time, happy crafting.